This panel is going to be on medical cannabis. Um, we're going to be talking about the state of the art of whole herbal cannabis, whole crude cannabis, as it's sometimes called in the UN system, and uh, how that cannabis has been delivered traditionally as a medicine, how it's used as a medicine now, uh, and uh, some of those, you know, the medical issues around that. That's going to be the, the first two speakers uh, who are speaking from a medical perspective. And then this is going to be really, I think it's going to be a really interesting thing we're going to do here because then we're going to take that information about the usefulness of cannabis as a medicine and we're going to have the next two speakers talk about how we can implement policy at the national level to actually integrate such a complex set of medicines. Like, uh, again, to quote Dr. Mishulam, I think he was the one who said, cannabis is like a medicine factory, and it produces a lot of different medicines. So I'm Michael Krawitz. I'm a special advisor to FAT, and on the uh, committee with the, uh, with the uh, setting up the, the panels and the speakers for the, uh, the international policy conference here. I am a medical patient. I'm a, a cannabis user myself for chronic pain. And I served in the United States Air Force and became injured. And this was at a time when, in the 1980s, you could learn about cannabis. There were certainly a lot of people out there that had been working for a long time on cannabis as a medicine. But uh, I really didn't have access to a lot of that. The internet really hadn't been born yet. Uh, so I had to learn about it on my own trial and error and uh, doing a lot of research. It just turns out that I have a family history in the antiques business, in the auction business, and with those two combined, it seemed to give me a perfect uh, opportunity to really dig into the history of cannabis. And uh, I became an activist and an advocate for patients to go through the hoops and, and navigate the medical systems. I worked with the Veterans Affairs Department in the United States. Um, and. Uh, successfully have, have navigated these systems for years and helped others throughout the country do so. We've created national policy throughout the VA system on cannabis. And all that uh, is, is uh, stuff that um, we had to really forge our way through. And um, it, it's, it's sad that we have to do that as patients, that we have to carry such a burden uh, but we really don't have the facilities and the ability to really uh, access the information uh, in, the, in the normal routine fashion. In the VA in the United States, we still can't have the VA doctors participate in our state medical marijuana programs where we actually get the cannabis. There's a, still a disconnect there. So I, uh, I, I really I can't even begin to tell you what a beautiful exploration it's been of learning about the history of cannabis. The cannabis is a, was learned about in ancient times as a, as a medicine, as a traditional medicine. Some of the earliest books on medicine uh, talked about its, its uh, applications for medical patients. And our modern system in the United States, I think, goes back mostly to uh, O'Shaughnessy, Dr. O'Shaughnessy, uh, the British government studying India and studying the use of cannabis in India, India, uh, Africa, other countries, uh, China, with age-old medicine. Uh, and it's rather recent in the United States, and rather recent that we have a Latin name uh, for, for cannabis, Cannabis Sativa L. Um, this information matriculated into the medical systems through the medical journals in the mid-1800s. Finally, in the 1900s, resolved to some good patent medicines, and then was squashed by the war effort. There's a lot of different theories, but it's clear that in, in the time of the World War I, World War II, the veterans in World War I could come back and get a whole host of different cannabis medicines at the pharmacy. And the World War II veterans came back and there was literally no pharmacy medicines available. And doctors stopped learning about cannabis in 1942 in the textbooks. So that you know, sets the stage for where we are now post what you call post Prop 215, the medical marijuana initiative in California that sort of turned the tide on how we look at medicine uh, in, with regard to cannabis and how cannabis is delivered and set the stage for a lot of our modern policy. So that's the, kind of the history and background of, of what we're talking about. And I just want to point out that this is all about variety, diversity, and entourage, that, that you have uh, uh, cannabis out there in this huge variety of different forms. And to really truly capture the essence of that, you'd have to have 100 different medicine bottles. And eventually, I think we probably will. You know, we're just talking about that, I mean, and Pavel. So I, I think that uh, 
We'll get there, uh, but right now, how do we get there? So we, we'll talk about the medicine. I want to introduce our, our guests, our speakers. Uh, Dr. Franjo Grote Herman, who will speak first, uh, studied at the University of Cologne. He runs a medical practice and, and devoted, is devoted to the use of cannabis and cannabinoids for medical applications. He's the founder and, and chairman of the German Association for Cannabis as Medicine, as well as founder and executive director of the IACM, the International Alliance for Cannabis as Medicine. He edits the IACM Bulletin and is well uh, published in articles and books on therapeutic potential of cannabis, as well as the pharmacology and, and toxicology as well. Uh, Dr. Ilya Resnick. Uh, Dr. Resnick is a board certified specialist in adult forensic and clinic clinical neuros neuropsychiatry at Miranda Diagnost Diagnostic and Consulting Center in Israel. Dr. Resnick has published many original papers, including controlled trials in clinical psychiatry and neuropsychopharmacology. His current main interest is in the fields of medicinal use of cannabis, especially for uh, various neuropsychiatric uh, illnesses. And I'll note that um, I am a member of the board of the IACM, the International Alliance of Cannabis Medicine, as a patient advocate, and I'm very proud to call these uh, two esteemed doctors, uh, colleagues, who are also fellow board members uh, and, and directors of the uh, IACM. Uh, Pavel Pakta, a PhD. Pavel uh, is an independent consultant uh, from the Czech Republic, former Deputy Secretary of the International Narcotics Control Board, and an expert on policy inside the UN, and will be able to help us a lot understand that end of it. Dr. Catherine Ritter is a medical doctor whose main experience is in drug-related issues in healthcare for key affected populations. Dr. Ritter joined the Swiss Federal Office of Public Health in 2015 after several years as a prison doctor in Switzerland. Um, helping to implement harm reduction and effective drug treatment programs. Interesting to this group might be that Dr. Ritter's work with the United Nations Drug Control Program uh, has worked in the European Council's Pompadour group. Pompadour group. So I guess uh, that's all I had for uh, our uh, introduction. And, and you know, just to set us on the tone, you know, we're looking for uh, the, the medicinal history of medicinal information with, uh, you know, kind of an eye towards sustainability. How can we sustain uh, this great variety and diversity that we've come to know from ancient times and still have a little bit of a handle on today? We still have patients out there gaining access to hundreds of different varieties of either uh, plant material or products on the shelf. And uh, it is my great honor to introduce uh, Dr. Franjo groten Herman. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, is the PowerPoint presentation ready? Yeah. We'll get your PowerPoint going. Okay. How's your microphone? I think the microphone is fine. Good. Well, I, I came here to give honor to the extraordinary work of the FAAT. Um, well, I'm a scientist and I don't know much about UN regulations and so, and I think they do a tremendous good work and that's why I did the way from Germany to Vienna. Usually I do not travel very much, but I first want to say thank you, FAAT, Danke schön, Merci bien, Muchas gracias, Efersto. Shukran, F-A-A-T, for your work. So now my talk. Um, I want to say something about uh, the research on cannabis in 15 minutes. It's, I hope we can catch something. I want to start with the understanding of the basic understanding of the endocrine system. Uh, we all have our endocrine system. It plays an important role in the body, in the function of many physiological, pathophysiological issues. And in, it's consisting of first endocannabinoids, then receptors, which are not only cannabis receptors, but also other receptors the enzymes which are responsible for the production of the endocrine and the degradation, 
Um, yeah, and we will see what is the role of this system in the body. Next, please. Next, please. So now we see some functions of the body where the endocrine system is involved. And if you see the whole list, it starts with diseases of energy and metabolism, such as appetite. Then we have the large group of pain and inflammation. Then we have the large group of central nervous system disorders. You may read them in a few seconds. Many know about multiple sclerosis or epilepsy, but it's much more. It's Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. Next one. Uh, we have an influence of the endocrine system on the cardiovascular system, the heart, arteries. Then we have eye diseases, glaucoma. Next one. Next one, please. Of course, cancer. Cancer is rather new research. It it's started in 1996 with a study on rats and mice. We have gastrointestinal disorders such as irritable bowel syndrome, which may be an endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. That's a syndrome where endocannabinoids are missing. Then we have musculoskeletal disorders. Next one. And reproductive functions. So what you see here is that there is nearly any organ or tissue without the endocrine system. It's in our bones. It's not only in our central nervous system. It's in our blood. It's in our lungs. It's in our heart. It's nearly in every system of our body. So next one. So the first thing I want to tell you, and if you understand it, you know much more than many, many physicians or any physician knows. Um, first, the basic principle, how nerve cells talk to each other. This is basic neurobiology. First, there is a presynaptic nerve cell. The synapse is, is the next one, please. This is the gap between two nerves, two, two nerve cells. So, and they talk each other with neurotransmitters from the presynaptic, before the synapse, and after synapse, the postsynaptic membrane. So below you see the uh, postsynaptic uh, membrane. The words of the, this communication are neurotransmitters. For example, glucine or glutamate or uh, no adrenaline and so on. So the next um, slide is about what does the endocannabinoid system do in this? So please, the next slide. So this is a little bit uh, less precise. It's, um, you see on the left side, you see the presynaptic nerve cell. Yeah? On the other side, you see the postsynaptic nerve cells, and the gap between is the synapse. Yes? And we see a stimulus, one. An action, action potential. And it, it, it um, results in the release of gamma amino butyric acid, GABA, and this goes to the other cell and activates the receptor, the GABA receptor, on the postsynaptic membrane. So if this activation is very strong, the body might want to reduce it. How does he do it? He uses endocannabinoids. Endocannabinoids are produced in the postsynaptic membrane and released into the gap in the synapse to go to the 
presynaptic membrane where there are CB1 receptors. And these are activated. And after they have been activated, they tell the stimulus one, well, it's enough GABA, we have enough, calm down. So some neurotransmitters bring us up, such as noradrenaline, and then anechronomids bring us down. Yes? So if, let's, for example, let's the PAG in the central nervous system in the brain, a periaqueductic peri ray, there's, is, that's an important um, part of the brain for pain. If there is a too large activity in this system, then endocannabinoids are released. They are released on demand. They are not always there, but they are released on demand. And they, they uh, are there for seconds or very few minutes. And then the state is again off, open, yes? So this is a, a circle, you understand? That's what we call retrograde inhibition because it's from the postsynaptic brain to the present. It's retrograde. <coughs> so that's how endocannabinoids come into this action in every organ, in every tissue. Next one. Yes, next one. Next one. So, what we should understand is that the major role of the system is to inhibit an overactivation over of other neurotransmitters, nearly all other neurotransmitters. Yeah. GABA, glutamate, noradrenaline, glutecine. Next one. So what is the intention, the function of the endocrine system? It is to bring back the body, to what we call homeostasis, a balanced state. Yeah. We have an overactivation. We need such activation, for example, by noradrenaline to be to fight and to flee and so on. But we need also something to calm us down again. And there comes also the treatment, because the endocannabis system is not always strong enough to bring it down. For example, if you have chronic pain, then the endocannabis system is overactivated. You see more endocannabinoids, you see more cannabis receptors, and you still have pain. And then it is, makes sense to give subtypes, exocannabinoids, cannabis from the cannabis plant, mainly THC, to activate the CB1 receptor from outside. There is a major misunderstanding by many people that endocannabinoids are good. They are neither good nor bad. A high level of endocannabinoids in the body means this body is stressed because it tries to bring down some stressing event. It may be nausea, it may be spasticity, it may be pain, it may some, even if you're doing sports. Sports is activating the endocrine system because it means stress. So the runner's high, which was usually thought to be caused by opioids, is indeed caused by endocannabinoids. Sports is stress for the body, and it reacts with endocannabinoids, and you get high. So you, get, you may have be craving for a 20-kilometer run. Yeah? If you stop it, there's something missing. You need your portion of endocannabinoids. Yes? Okay. Now we come to the treatment side. Next one, please. So... Uh, with my colleague Kirsten Müller-Wahl from the Medical School of Hannover, I did a review on clinical studies, controlled clinical studies uh, on, in, on cannabis and cannabis in, in uh, different diseases. 
And what you see very easily is we have more than 140 control clinical studies with about 8,000 8, something more patients. Controls means that you have a double blind situation. For example, if you have a, want to do a study with pain, you have two groups. One is receiving a placebo, one is receiving a cannabinoid or cannabis, and the patient does not know what is the placebo or what is right, and the doctor also does not know, he's also blind. Only the, the scientist knows, who is conducting the study knows, who is double blind. This means controlled, yeah? So what you see is we have many studies in four diseases or four, well, conditions. One is chronic pain. The second is multiple sclerosis, mainly spasticity in multiple sclerosis, but also uh, urinary dysfunction. Then we have nausea and vomiting. Most studies have been done in the 1980s. And we have appetite loss. And the rest, there is not very much. And there comes a major misunderstanding. Many people say, we have, don't have enough evidence for such and such and such medical condition. This is right. But we cannot blame the patient that no study has been done on this issue. Yeah. So, next stories. So, uh, on the next two slides, there are some medical conditions of patients in my medical practice. I listed about 50 or 60, I don't know. And there are diseases where there even are no case reports in the literature. All these patients got an approval to use cannabis for medical reasons in Germany. Um, since 2007, it is possible to get an exemption for the use of cannabis from a pharmacy with an exemption from the government. And until 2017, about 1,000 patients got this exemption. And 300 patients were my patients. And so the government agreed that people with tinnitus, with acne inversa, with hyperhidrosis, with restless leg syndrome, with all these conditions where there usually is no controlled clinical trial, sometimes there are case reports, and sometimes even that not. For example, I give, give, you, an, give you an example, tinnitus. It's a hearing disorder, huh? can be very strong. I have a patient with 19, 90 decibel. This is, means that he has, uh, well, all the time, a heavy noise in his head. You know? These people often commit suicide. When he takes cannabis, it's reduced to 20 or 30 decibel. Nearly immediately. How could I convince the government that this patient with tinnitus, there's nothing in the literature on cannabis and tinnitus, look at it, gets it. And I thought about Okay, what, what, is, what is tinnitus? What is, what is causing tinnitus? And I, I came to the conclusion by the literature that it's very similar to epilepsy. Epilepsy is an overactivation in certain brain regions. And in, in the case of tinnitus, it's in brain regions which are responsible for hearing. For, for, for hearing is not only in the ear, but it has to be processed in the brain and it can, can come from the brain. Uh, tinnitus is not from the ear, but from the brain, like epilepsy. And I send them some, some graphs and some accept, and then they, ex expect, uh, they, they, they said, okay, we give this man an exemption. And I have several patients with tinnitus who got an exemption. There will be never a study on cannabis and tinnitus, perhaps in 30 years. And what should we do with the patient until this time? We have no clinical data, wait for 30 years, come later back. 
Next one, please. So I am very happy that I found people, scientists, doctors on a worldwide scale, which very nice guys, very, very good guys and women. Um, for which I, which, which I was lucky to work with. You may have known somebody, uh, Rafi Mechulam, for example, or Mark Waugh, or Roger Pertwee, or Ethan Rousseau. I think Michael's also on there, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ilya is there, really not cut, he's not dried. Manuel Guzman, you may, Manuel from, uh, he's a very good friend from Madrid. Uh, you may know him if you live in Spain uh, because he did much research on cannabis and cancer. And um, we are trying to meet every second year. It's a family meeting with 100 or 120. Last year the family meeting increased to 350. And the next year it will increase to 500 or 600 in Berlin, I don't know. So the family is enlarging, and I'm very happy that I could contribute to this development. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordon Herman. Uh, next, if uh, Ilya can come up, Dr. Resnick will uh, kind of fill out the picture for us a little bit more clearly on the uh, science of, of cannabis as a medicine and how exactly, how exactly we can uh, apply this in our modern age. You know, uh, Dr. Resnick, while you're setting up there, I want to just mention something. I hope it doesn't, uh, <laughs> hope it doesn't uh, cross a line that I'm not supposed to cross by saying this, but I remember you mentioning a long time ago an idea that you had read or heard about uh, or thought about, I can't even remember, of a, uh, what, what you might call the Chinese apothecary format of distribution of cannabis of the future. And you talked about having a uh, kind of a genetic bank that you could then uh, give your uh, personal characteristics to that would then design a seed that you would then grow and it would be a medicine just for you that was designed just to create homeostasis for you and that stuck with me because I mean that's the kind of visionary kind of stuff that's the kind of stuff that I like to uh, think about and I, I bring it up now because I think this is a good um, you know, kind of a good bridge to where I'd like to go with this conversation. How can we apply age-old use of a plant where you really have to know the grower, you have to know where it's from. There's regional characteristics of the plant material, there's plant, plant characteristics that are drawn from the soil, the air, even the culture and the heritage of the uh, community growing it. And that comes right through the plant material, right into the medicine. And we're finding that the complexity of these products is drawn from not just a few basic cannabinoids like we had been looking at, but also a whole host of terpenes, which are not just confined to cannabis, but when in cannabis, have a very synergistic effect with these cannabinoids and increase the complexity of this medicine by an order of magnitude or more. That you don't just have four or five or six cannabinoids, but you got 46 key constituents. And I'm a math guy, so I can definitely tell you the difference between a six variable equation and a 46 variable equation is astronomically different. So how do we bridge that? How do we come up with the medicines uh, short of having clinical trials for every single thing that you could ever imagine that would fall out of a neurological homeostasis? So anyway, food for thought. As soon as we get the PowerPoint going, Dr. Resnick will get going. I want to announce that uh, Manu Serene was on the schedule to be speaking on this panel, and uh, 
sends best regards, just could not attend. Tried his best, just could not attend. Uh, yes, um, thank you, uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, we have some uh, technical obstacle, but I will begin uh, my talk with uh, without uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, my apologizing to uh, for this technical obstacle, but I suppose it uh, it will not prevent me to bring some um, some I suppose necessary words um, about the sustainable necessity to use cannabis uh, in our basket for medical services. Uh, we are clinicians, so we need to have uh, as much as more uh, abilities and uh, uh, option to provide better care for our patients. You know that majority of the medical needs of our patients are not satisfied, not in the countries, uh, or not in the developing countries, as well not in developed countries. So we need to look for better option how to put together conventional methods and uh, some other methods that coming to our practice uh, being uh, forgotten, being abandoned, being neglected, such as uh, cannabis that had been used for the medical for the medical purposes for the many many years, but was abandoned, neglected, forgotten, and now we need to bring it back to modern practice in order to uh, include it to the mainstream treatment. And uh, for such purposes, we need to construct uh, the whole uh, arrangement of government bodies, NGOs, medicinal associations, a group of practitioners, in order to, uh, to understand better what we are doing and uh, to pro in order to provide our patients better and safe care. Uh, being uh, our parliament advisor for cannabis regulation, I try to make my work mostly for educational policy makers uh, and uh, care people uh, in this area in order to educate them what a real need uh, we, need, we have as a physicians because the main obstacle uh, to, uh, to bring cannabis to the, main, to the mainstream and general practice are the reluctance of the medical community, not else. The regulators will comply with us as well as medical community will demand to uh, put cannabis on the uh, legal uh, basic for the regular use. This is why we need to uh, put together all our efforts. For such purposes, um, several years ago, uh, our association, uh, EACM, uh, just issued the uh, declaration of the medicinal cannabis. It was initiated by EACM, but mostly it was initiated by Franjo himself. And my, uh, uh, I have a lot of appreciation because I was one of the person who uh, supported it. I suppose we, we, I was the sen second who signed this declaration. Unfortunately, I could not expl uh, uh, demonstrate you. This is a very, very short declaration of uh, of human rights in the way where we, how we need to, uh, to provide cannabis to our patients. It has two points. And last day, uh, Franjo mentioned another one, one another important point. We just looked uh, after the uniform uh, declaration of the human rights, saying that uh, every person sh should have his rights for uh, safety, and uh, 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 affordable condition. The same is uh, the same uh, we have for the cannabis policy. It should be affordable uh, for patients. Each patient who needs to use cannabis for his medical purposes should be allowed to use it under the safe conditions. And uh, each physician uh, should be able to recommend or prescribe cannabis for his patient, making it legally and uh, affordably for patients. So this is a two points.
but they are very important for all medical community because, as I mentioned, medical community in all countries are the main uh, obstacle to cannabis promotion for the medical purposes. They are very reluctant and very difficult to communication. We just, uh, in the previous session, we discussed it from the, on the, on the sample of the uh, example of the France, how it is difficult to convince the physicians to even to think about the ability to use cannabis for every, everyday practice. The same, uh, the same situation in, uh, uh, in many other different countries. I visited this year Uruguay, Poland, uh, uh, Czech Republic, uh, and many other countries, uh, Austria uh, and uh, Cyprus. In each country, we have the same problem with medical community. Medical doctors need to educate themselves. We need to encourage them to educate themselves in order to bring them to be together in order, in order to be comply with this such declaration. This is a very simple declaration saying that each patient has his rights to be treated with cannabis and we need to provide him uh, it affordable, well, good quality uh, and a safe environment. For such purposes, we need to do some very simple measures. What we need to do, first of all, we need to educate ourselves, we, medical doctors, we need to educate ourselves, it's our duty. Just without any, any explanation. We need just to educate ourselves because when I had my uh, basic medical education, we just didn't know nothing about endocannabinoid system. Because of the time, we need to improve our knowledge in order to uh, understand better what we are doing. Second, we need to know how to approach the patients. We need uh, to educate ourselves and uh, yesterday I had a very good conversation with one journalist. He, he asked me, what is the most difficult uh, uh, in your treatment process uh, using cannabis as a, uh, as a treatment substance? The most difficult part is a patient's education. This is the most difficult part of the whole treatment with using cannabis because we need to load a lot of efforts in order to work with the patients on individual basis, basis uh, to work with the caregivers, to, uh, to he, with his other physicians who work with such patients. So we need to have a lot of work. Majority of the doctors are not prepared to this. It is my own opinion, unproved opinion, but it's my personal uh, impression that majority of doctors just are not ready to work individually with the patients, to devote to such patients enough time to work with his expectations, with his previous ex uh, experience with cannabis, with his knowledge, his habits, and to appreciate his autonomy to understand to, and his rights to use uh, cannabis. And I don't have any moral dilemma. In the previous section, we had a, a one doctor said, yes, if I have in my clinic uh, some patient that says, Okay, doctor, I have my modest or not, or big uh, uh, personal experience with cannabis. It helps me to relieve my pain, to relieve my anxiety. And I, uh, I have no any kind of moral dilemma. I should listen to him carefully and try to, not to satisfy him, but to understand if it could be used for a safe and uh, responsible treatment for them. So in, it is pretty legal in the majority of the countries. I hope so. In the uh, countries I visited, it is legalized, cannabis is legalized for the medical purposes. We just need to understand better what we are doing. And medical cannabis declaration, it, it is a way how other medical uh, associations and societies should uh, regulate cannabis for the medical purposes. Another point that four years after initiation and issuing such declaration, World Medical Association issued the uh, statement, paper, statement paper saying medical cannabis is okay. It, it had four years for them to appreciate that patients has the, have their rights and doctors also have their rights to prescribe cannabis. So World Medical Association stated that they had a lo uh, longer, longer uh, statement about 11 or 12 points, but they just uh, explain the way how they uh, 
see cannabis in the frame of the whole treatment uh, story, they're saying it could be uh, used for the medical purposes when the doctors are educated and trained, patients explained everything about side effects, adverse events possible that could happen in, on, in all kinds of treatment, it could happen in each stage. So we need to prepare our patients and their caregivers and their family members. We need to provide them better guideline, gu guidance and to follow up them carefully and responsibly. So in, the, in this case, having together set and setting, having good co quality uh, cannabis, we could use it for medical purposes, understanding what we are doing. And World Medical uh, Association is agree with us. It's fully comply with our declaration. And I'm very happy to uh, say it here that, uh, but they only, uh, my only uh, objection for them, that saying the cannabis should be uh, uh, taken in the account only when other medical options are used. So they put cannabis as a second or third or fourth line of treatment. This is my only uh, uh, contradiction with uh, uh, this uh, statement of World Medical Association that we, uh, we uh, International Association of Medicinal Cannabis, we are uh, looking for the cannabis probably as a first option. And this in the la uh, long, long, long list of the many, many various diseases that uh, just showed us, uh, Franjo showed us, uh, in, my, in some of these diseases, we just do not have any, any uh, reputable and uh, solid treatment because it is orphan diseases, it is rare diseases. Nobody even never will uh, uh, study it it's, uh, in randomized controlled trials. For what we need to wait, we need to consider cannabis as a first line in some cases, and probably in some cases a second line, but cannabis should be uh, weighted as a, a probable first, uh, first line option for majority of the diseases. And uh, if you have a patient with already existing experience with cannabis, it should be appreciated. We should not neglect it, we should appreciate it, but we need to provide to this patient very good guidance. In this, for these purposes, doctors should be prepared. My uh, personal impression is that majority of doctors just unprepared. It is a, a, a role of our association, International Association of Cannabinoid Medicine, to educate doctors, to train them all over the world where they invite us. And uh, in, Israel, we have, in Israel, we have uh, several uh, international conferences where I invite Israeli physicians uh, each year, and I invite um, uh, our board members to be case speakers there. A majority of our board members already visited Israel with very good lectures, but it is not enough. I suppose we need to uh, increase and enlarge our experience to bring new physicians to be uh, available for the young doctors from the internship, from the residencies in order to, uh, to uh, prepare them for the new era where we will we have cannabis of good quality, maybe uh, uh, quality for good, uh, good uh, manufacturing properties, maybe not, but we need to prepare our medical community and our patients and caregivers and society that cannabis is here and is here not to uh, uh, to be uh, neglected for the years. It is here to the help our patients and to us to build b better cannabinoid medicine, to understand what we are doing, to improve our methods. And I hope that such meetings will promote this uh, uh, very important area to the new uh, direction. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now that we've heard kind of the state of the art from uh, Drs. Resnick and Gordon Herman, now we're gonna switch gears just a little bit here and talk about uh, the issues from the policy perspective. Uh, in, a, in a world where the system of medicine seems to boil everything down to a single molecule and we have uh, uh, you know, medicine that we've talked about is quite complex, uh, you know, where do we go from here? How, what is the path forward and to start us on this path? 
is uh, Pavel Pachter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you uh, also the organizers of this uh, conference for having me here. What I can contribute from my experience uh, is to provide some information about uh, legislative and regulatory framework for the use of uh, uh, cannabis as medicine. And uh, let's start immediately. You know, we, we all know that uh, cannabis is controlled under the International Drug Control Treaties. There are three such treaties. One is from the 1961, so already almost 50 years old. 1961, Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. Then, you know, we have the Convention on Psychotropic Substances. That is from 1971. And the third of these three drug control treaties is the 1988 Convention Against Illicit Traffic in Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances. We have heard a lot of criticism of these conventions and basically of their paradigm. Paradigm of basic principle of these conventions is to limit the use of controlled substances to medical and scientific purposes. So you may agree or you may disagree with this basic principle of these conventions. Well, what is the global reality? What you can expect for the future? You participate in many meetings like that, and you, have, uh, you, you can see a lot of criticism of these treaties. But basically, when governments, when those who are really deciding met last time uh, in uh, 2016 at the United Nations uh, Special Session on general, of General Assembly on Drugs, they agreed unanimously, so including Canada uh, and others, they agreed that uh, the basis of uh, their approach to drugs will continue to be these three drug control conventions. So that was a global agreement of governments, and these are your governments. Uh, they agreed in 2016 that they will stick to this paradigm that they stick to this basic principle that uh, drugs controlled substances under these treaties should be limited to medical and scientific purposes. Fine. So uh, we know this reality. Probably this reality will not change uh, uh, too much in the year, years to come. But uh, uh, what does it mean? Uh, we have problems with cannabis. We speak about cannabis. So. Those substances which are controlled under the international treaties do not have to be there forever. You know, there is a mechanism of review of uh, the appropriateness of the control of these substances under the treaties. Perhaps you would agree that it is good to, to limit fentanyl to only medical and scientific purposes, and I think you will agree that it is good to limit heroin only for medical and scientific purposes, and methamphetamine and many other substances under international control, but most of you will probably disagree to have cannabis under, this, under these treaties. Well, so uh, what? We have just heard yesterday uh, that the World Health Organization, after so many years of requests from the civil society and also from some international drug control bodies uh, to look into cannabis and to provide a scientific review of cannabis, that uh, we were all expecting the, the result of that review. And we were speculating what is the result of the review, because we could read the background documents. And we were surprised that the World Health Organization decided to postpone the publication of the results of this review. Well, what does it indicate? Uh, they were able to, you no, know, they had two years to, to look into cannabis. So I would uh, judge that there might be some political considerations in play. We will see. We will see in the next future. It would not be for the first time. So cannabis is unfortunately an extremely politicized substance. And this is, this is unfortunate for cannabis. Simply, whether to have cannabis under con international control or whether not to have under international control is a political decision. Political decision because, you know, why do you not have uh, alcohol under international control? Why do you not have, let us say, cut? You could also get good uh, reasons for having cut or having alcohol under international control. No, a political decision of governments is not to have them. So whether we have we will have cannabis in the future under international control, will not be so much depend on some scientific reviews. It is basically a political decision of governments, and these are also your governments. Fine, so we have this reality.
realities, cannabis is under international control, so what does it mean for its medical use? Is it prohibited? Is it uh, impossible under this convention? The answer is no. No international drug control treaty prohibits cannabis, prohibits medical use of cannabis. If you look at the schedules of the 1961 single convention, so cannabis is that means the flowering tops, the herbal product, cannabis in, in Schedule 1 and in so-called Schedule 4 of the single convention. In Schedule 1, there are all the basic <laughs> narcotic drugs which you know, like morphine and like, uh, you know, uh, oxycodone and others. And uh, so this is the standard schedule for narcotic drugs. And cannabis, when made available, should be used according to the system prescribed for drugs in this schedule. What means Schedule 4? Schedule 4 means that the drugs are considered to be particularly dangerous, and by the same time, not to having any special therapeutic advantage in comparison to other drugs which are less dangerous. So cannabis was placed in the schedule, for example, with heroin, and is there with some fentanyl analogs, and so on. Uh, experts look at it now, after many years, in WHO, and when I read the documents, I think uh, they uh, do not think anymore that cannabis should be in this schedule. But is it a schedule which, pro which requires governments to prohibit the substance? No, it is only a schedule drawing the attention that the substance is special and that they may consider if it would be appropriate for the countries to prohibit it. So this is not a request, this is not a must, this is simply kind of warning, you know, encouragement to governments to be especially careful. If somebody allows medical use of cannabis, is definitely not violating this treaty. And in addition, the uh, 61 Convention has a, uh, one uh, special thing with respect to cannabis. Extracts and tinctures of cannabis are included in Schedule 1 of this convention only. So even the drafters of the 61 convention in those years, in the 1950s, 60s, were not thinking at all about prohibition of cannabis extracts, cannabis tinctures. This is for them a normal controlled medicine. So basically, if we see this, uh, we can conclude that uh, the international treaties enable the medical use of cannabis, and this is totally on the decision of national governments whether they will allow the medical cannabis system or not. Now, if you look at governments and their approach, we can now say that we have like more than 30 countries where there are some medical cannabis programs and we hope to have like 40 countries in the, in the near future. One after another, recently in Europe, Portugal, Luxembourg, even the United Kingdom, which, is, uh, which was definitely a surprise for many. And we have committees looking into it, as we have heard in France, and I think in Austria as well, so looking into this possibility to establish the system. So it's something which is totally at the national level to decide upon. Uh, when now we have heard how, how complicated the substance is, how complicated cannabis is, that it may be a number of different medicines. So uh, what to do with that at the national level? Well, uh, the national regulators are, of course, used to regulate medicines. They have their laws and uh, regulations for medicines. And uh, they have laws how to register medicines. So we have heard they require these clinical trials, which may take years and which even will never happen because have no sense for uh, some of these indications. So they require that. And we have a few cannabis medicines based on synthetic cannabinoids, bains of extracts like Sativex, like Epidiolex, which satisfy these very strict conditions of registration of medicines. But what to do with the rest, which we have heard is so much uh, possibility to use. This requires, I think, a creat creativity of governments, you know, and positive approach of government. So it really does not depend on the United Nations. It depends on your governments, how they will do it in your countries, what they will do. 
In the beginning, they were forced into these medical cannabis uh, programs mainly by patients, you know. And uh, this was like in California, 1996, and then continuing, I don't know, in Canada, 2001, by the core decision which brought the government, forced the government to provide uh, uh, patients with cannabis from a legal source so that they do not have to violate, violate the legislation. So this was like a phase of kind of compassionate programs, you know, let's them enable to get some kind of cannabis. But later on, and we are now in, in a stage when we go further, when we have some higher level or better level of medical use of cannabis, and we, when we come uh, to the uh, really programs which involve cannabis of pharmaceutical quality. As it was mentioned here, that the products are safe, that the products have stable content of active ingredients. This is, of course, very important for doctors. We have heard how doctors are hesitant to prescribe these drugs. If these drugs are provided to them in Europe in the format which they are used to use, that will be better for them. Even for the patients, it will be more acceptable if they will get uh, cannabis products in the forms of medicines they are used to. And of course, the crucial role here is played by insurance. Especially here in Europe, we are used to that, that our medicines are covered by the insurance schemes. And that's a great step when Germany introduced a system, maybe not 100% satisfactory, but still providing some very important uh, part of the patients with this insurance coverage. So your governments are really free now and should be creative, you know. They should not be afraid of the treaties because what is now the policy of the international community? In, in 2016, at this uh, special session, the governments agreed they will continue to stick to these treaties, but they also agreed that they should be applied in a flexible manner. Flexibility is now uh, really something, a word which is important. So, you know, something which appeared to be not possible under the conventions, like decriminalization of uh, uh, drug use, is now quite normal. This is in line with the treaties. Uh, if you ask the international drug control bodies, is Portugal, is the Czech Republic un, in line with the treaties when they're decriminalized? Of course they are in line with the treaties. Uh, they are not violating any provisions of these treaties. The others could join if they want. They, will, they are not prevented by, by international law. You have such, uh, uh, you know, uh, issues like the drug consumption rooms in the part uh, in the past, uh, the international drug control bodies were extremely critical of such uh, such uh, uh, entities because people are consuming illicitly obtained drugs there, and it is quite uh, it is more or less under the eyes of the of the authorities of the respective country. Now they acknowledge that it is possible to integrate such uh, such entities into their system of uh, prevention, treatment, uh, uh, rehabilitation, etc., of addicts. So there is a lot of flexibility, and uh, if I would say from my uh, humble experience for, for, of uh, regulator to this. So governments are trying. Uh, we have already a number of examples in the world. Some of them are better, some of them are worse. Uh, there is no ideal yet that you would copy this country only. I would say that in Europe, for example, in Germany, in the Netherlands, in the Czech Republic, in Italy, we exaggerated uh, this issue of state monopoly. This is a kind of uh, uh, understanding of the treaty which is very, very strict and very narrow and it's not necessary. You could have other, other uh, uh, presentations, and you can have system which would be better for for supply of uh, of these drugs to patients. So the regulators should really follow patients. Patients should tell uh, the regulators what they need, and the regulators should try to satisfy them. And the systems should change and develop and become better and better. And that's it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.